with this picture. Um, I suppose technically it's not a picture, it's a bit of a mashup from Google Earth. Um, but we think of ourselves as being a very small country, which actually isn't true. Um, we've got a land mass similar to the United Kingdom, but they've got 65 million people, we've got five. Um, the distance from Cape Reale to Bluff, if you take the slightly long way around, such as the Kenneth Brothers Tour Aotearoa bikepacking route, which I've done, it, it's 3,000 kilometers. But that's literally the distance between Istanbul and London. So the whole European continent is um, embraced by Cape Reale to Bluff. So we're not small. The next thing is, we have wonderful things about our land, which I'll come back to. But the next thing is, um, we've got the fourth largest, uh, we're responsible for the fourth largest oceanic um, resource in the world. Uh, that's the size of our EEZ. Um, and of course it goes um, a long way up uh, into the Pacific and it goes a long way south down towards Antarctica. Um, and um, rather wonderfully where we're sitting, perched on the edge of the tectonic plates, the tectonic plates uh, carve this huge Z uh, through the Pacific which I think is rather wonderful. I think about New Zealand, I think about Aotearoa, I think about Zealandia underneath us. And even more excitingly, we've discovered a continent underneath that. Um, so there's a lot to this. Um, and um, the very special thing about our oceanic resource, and uh, I won't be touching on that today, is that a lot of that is in the Southern Ocean, uh, which is um, the least degraded of um, the world's oceans. Um, but it also has the highest rate of endemic species. Um, unique to it. And um, so that's a massive responsibility for us. And it was really, really good news um, in the last um, little while um, that we've been waiting 20 years for this. We now have a government um, that is working on, um, on the, uh, no. Rich, how are you? How are you? <laughs> 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 serious about having our first ever oceans policy and, and that's going to be a big task for David Parker next term. He's very tied up on the RMA reforms this term. Um, and um, so I, there's a, a great deal of it. Um, I've had a lot of optimism to listen about that. Um, what I suggested for a, a title today was that um, there we go. Um, we, not just out of uh, the humankind, um, has um, at most a decade um, left to solve the climate crisis, or rather the co-crises of um, climate and biodiversity. Um, we won't do all the work in a decade, but, um, there are many more decades after that to get better at that work, but if we're not on that trajectory um, over the next decade, then um, the uh, very rapid escalation in the damage we're doing, uh, very severe damage we're doing to climate and biodiversity, means that um, we won't be reversing any of that damage. Uh, we'll be able to ameliorate it a bit. But that's literally um, the time frame we're now working in. Uh, and hence um, the punchier title, Now or Never. Um, because if we don't step up to that this decade, um, and I'm about to make the case to you that actually for us here in New Zealand, is actually the next six months uh, which are the most crucial. And I'll, I'll come back to that point in a moment. Uh, um, so um, I'm just very briefly going to talk about the world and, and then uh, us. So this is um, a, an interesting um, quote from the State of the Planet uh, speech that uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guedes, gave last December, something he's been doing every year. And he said, we are facing a devastating pandemic, new heights of global heating, new lows of ecological degradation, and new setbacks in our work towards global goals for more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable development. To put it simply, the state of the planet is broken. Um, dear friends, humanity is waging war on nature, and this is suicidal. 
There can't, there shouldn't be in anybody's mind any doubt about that, seeing as the living systems of the Earth are our life support system. It's as simple as that. And um, I will show some slides to remind us in due course about how serious that degradation has been. Do not try and read this slide, I'll just explain it. Yeah. On the right is population growth from 1950, and because a lot of the analysis revolves around the decade, the, the century from 1950 to 2050, because it's after 1950 we get the huge pickup in the socio-economic trends, which are the orange graphs there, and um, that's, that's 1950 there. Actually, of all of those, by far the most spectacular growth in all those was international tourism. And our international tourism grew um, very significantly faster, about six or seven times faster than the global growth of international tourism. Um, and um, then on the right-hand side is the impact on Earth systems, the top three being um, the main climate um, change causing gases, and then all sorts of other things through biodiversity, um, deforestation, and the like. This is the work of the Stockholm Resilience Center and its planetary boundaries. And, and out of that, um, a, a very um, empirical study of um, the um, geochemical and physical boundaries of the planet, which if we breach them, um, we are in very dangerous territory. So the biggest overshoot is on biodiversity loss. Um, sorry, the biggest shoot that's down the bottom is in um, bio um, geochemical flows, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen. And that overshoot is entirely because of the way we grow food around the world. So it's not just a problem of nitrates in our rivers. Um, this is a fundamental problem. We've only been feeding the planet, uh, the people, the people on the planet, um, by, um, in part, um, heaping lots of nitrates and phosphorus on soils. So that's by far the biggest overshoot. Um, the next one around um, in terms of scale is the biodiversity loss, um, and that very much reflects a whole bunch of pressures I'll come back to, not the least of which is the land use change at 9 o'clock there. And the climate change one at um, midnight, or <laughs> noon, depending on whether you're pessimistic or optimistic, um, is, um, it has yet to breach that boundary, but we're perilously close to it. We've, we've built so much pressure into the climate systems. Um, that that's very hard to um, um, stop that pressure um, reaching some very serious tipping points. Um, Johan Rockström from the Stockholm Resilience Center and now at, um, um, in Berlin but still involved in Stockholm uh, has done this wonderful um, documentary on Netflix with um, Tony a couple of weeks ago called Breaking the Planetary Boundaries. Has anybody actually seen that yet? What did you make of it? Yeah. 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 Yes, to be expected. Yeah, to be expected. He didn't say a heck of a lot about um, sort of what to do about it. Like, there's a little piece on it. Um, you go to the electric cars and things like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It was a bit weak on that part. <laughs> yes. Um, I say this with huge respect, Brandon, but um, that was the case. And I felt that some of the other people interviewed. Um, were pointing us in some useful directions, and certainly Rockstar and his colleagues, both at Stockholm and the Potsdam Institute in Berlin, um, are, are, are deeply embedded um, in, in those. Um, in terms of this time frame, uh, this is the view of Jonathan Porritt, uh, one of my um, great guides on these things. This is his book that's now um, 18 months old, Hope in Hell, A Decade to Confront the Climate Crisis. This is lived through the last decade in which authentic grounded hope will be available to everyone we can do um, to serve our um, families, friends, and future generations. I won't go into the detail here. But the last point he's making is that it's now got to the point that with, um, to bring such pressure to bear on our political systems while we still have time to shift from today's uh, wholly inadequate incremental memories into full-on emergency response. And, and so he's saying, we have thus, we have no alternative but to commit to more <clears throat> radical political action and to get as many people as possible involved in campaigning and activities. So down at the bottom, his last line is, the case for civil disobedience is now overwhelming. Uh, he, importantly, and I'm glad he does say that this is non-violent civil disobedience, I'm a great fan of that. Um, and um, uh, I, I think uh, um, many of us 
uh, in the room would probably share that sense of um, intense um, pressure and a need to act incredibly boldly. Um, Cristiano Figueres was the um, Costa Rican diplomat who chaired the UN climate framework negotiations after the failure of Copenhagen through to the success of Paris. And um, she produced a book last year uh, which uh, deals with all these issues. This is a wonderful clip um, um, to a short um, video um, shot in Costa Rica where she grew up and where her father was one of the uh, key leaders in the Costa Rican democratic revolution in the late 40s. Um, and um, her wonderful phrase though is about stubborn optimism, uh, which I, I think is a fine phrase to um, keep us focused on what we need to do uh, and to not give up. That's the book, The Future We Choose, which says it's entirely up to us what future we end up in, in terms of um, um, good or bad. So just diving down to some of the detail, there is the likes of um, the Living Planet Index, um, and this is work of WWF and other scientists, and populations of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish shrank by 68% between uh, 1970 and 2016. And if you go back um, only two years before to 2014, that was only 6%, 60%. So um, that um, decline in population of species um, you know, uh, is um, accelerating very clearly, uh, as is the background rate of um, species extinction, now around 100 times that background rate. And, and so with each loss of species, we're snipping at the very intricate web of life. Um, and, um, and if we had this decimation of populations of um, all kinds of living things, bless you, um, I'm not suggesting you're next. The more we weaken um, that very, very intricate web of life, um, the greater the damage. So it's been getting really interesting um, over the last couple of years about this confluence of the climate crisis and um, the biodiversity crisis. And I think a really important turning point in that came um, just a couple of months ago when the UN side of this, the, the IPCC, and the biodiversity side of this, um, IPBES, um, produced a joint study um, about um, how um, these are co crises, and as we address one, we have to address both, but in addressing both, we solve both. And um, we've got um, COP14 on the biodiversity side in China in October, and then we've got COP26 on the climate side in Glasgow in November. Um, I think it's going to be really important to see um, how these international negotiations track. Um, other signs of sort of growing. Um, intelligence on this. This is the Das Gupta report from a, um, an economist at um, uh, Cambridge University in the UK about the economics of biodiversity. It's been likened, um, and I think it's a perfectly appropriate parallel, to the Stern report in 2006, uh, which um, opened up a, a completely different economic view um, of our um, approach to the climate crisis, and Stern is still very influential. Um, so that Das Gupta um, is doing that on biodiversity. I still feel slightly nervous about the economics part of that, um, but the idea that um, we will be able to use, um, sorry, this is kind of a second order issue. The first order issue is that we've got to um, be really committed to um, making sure everything we do works with nature, not against it. But once we've made that commitment, then some of the things will be helped, will be some monetary flows and, and, um, uh, and to stimulate and reward people for um, helping ecosystems recover, for example. Thus, that takes us to nature-based solutions, um, widely um, uh, viewed by a number of organizations, a, a credible one, that um, nature-based solutions um, can address about a third of our needs in the climate crisis. And that's fantastically um, important for us in New Zealand, um, given um, our enormous um, stock of nature here. Um, and I'll come back to that when I talk about New Zealand energy, of course. 
Um, I'm a business journalist, uh, and um, the fact that four value chains, uh, uh, food and beverage being one, uh, infrastructure and mobility two, energy three, uh, and um, Oh, sorry, fashion, that uh, was the last one. Um, those four value chains are, ca are causing 90% of biodiversity loss. Um, so that's why it is an issue for businesses. That's why it's really important that we've no sooner got the task force on climate-related financial disclosure, we now have one on um, task force on nature-related um, financial disclosure. Um, and um, I'll give an example from the Moa of some organizations that have taken this very seriously. So we've got these great co-crises at work, and, and that's just uh, one report uh, of a, a business-oriented nature that's looking at that. The last, uh, the, sorry, the next point I want to make about all this is that um, very, very broadly, we have um, a roadmap for how we get to uh, a net uh, carbon dioxide zero, um, energy system globally by 2050. So this is the work of the International Energy Agency. Um, don't try and understand those charts, they look better in the PDF. Um, but these are the pathways. And the very interesting thing about this is um, that these are all existing technologies. We're, we're not waiting for something to be developed. Now, um, you'll see a differentiation in those charts as to what are just in the prototype. Um, and yet they need to be proven um, to be economically viable and scalable. And, but it's, an, it's a huge change of emphasis by the International Energy Agency, part of the OECD, which was created during the first oil crisis in 1970, and has always been very fossil fuel focused for decades, although in recent decades it's been moving, and this is where it's got them. The, the re this doesn't mean we've solved the problems on carbon dioxide, um, we have to um, be incredibly disciplined and focused and ambitious to make this stuff happen. But I think we can take at least some comfort um, in being able to get there, um, which is not the case for methane. And um, again, this is a, a recent report in, in months, recent months from the United Nations Environment Program and from the uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition um, about um, uh, methane, and again, I, I won't dwell on the detail of it, um, but they're calling for very substantial reductions in methane. And um, the story um, some of us have, some people have been telling us here in New Zealand, is that um, methane is not a problem because it's short of gas, um, is very, very, very dangerous and completely wrong. Uh, there is, um, I won't show you now, but there's uh, some very powerful charts in the Climate Commission's um, final report um, showing how in, how much methane has contributed um, to our greenhouse gases in New Zealand um, versus CO2. Um, and yes, CO2 is <coughs> growing because of transport um, here in New Zealand, um, but the sheer power of methane um, means that there is a lot of pressure building uh, around the world um, for change on this. So on the left-hand side there is um, methane as a percentage of countries' um, greenhouse gases, and no surprise that we're on the far left there. And um, by very strong senses um, that um, very quickly, um, judging by some things such as that UN report, um, a lot more focus is going to come on methane. I think it's going to be very difficult for us in um, international climate negotiations <coughs> to persevere with our split target on gases, separating out methane from CO2. The only way we're going, because other countries don't, and the only way we're going to satisfy them that that's a logical thing for us to do, is if we are very ambitious on reducing methane, which we're not. And my main, I, I'm, I must say this, I preface it first of all, I'm a big supporter of what the Climate Change Commission um, has laid out in its entirety, it's very useful to have that fully integrated view of what we need to do. But I'm very critical of them for um, swallowing absolutely hook, line, and sinker um, what um, some major farming organizations have told them about their limited ability to reduce methane. Um, a, that is not right. Um, I'll come back to that point. Um, but B, um, that ignores 
I think, where the world is going on methane. So yes, um, a lot of that um, human-induced methane is from the oil and gas industry, but that's really been tightened up, especially with Trump out of office, um, because he took a few bliff for all those regulations when he was in office, Biden's restored them. Um, and so biogenic methane from animals, but also from rice paddies, they are as prodigious in their production of methane as our ruminant animals are. And these are the challenges um, for farmers globally. That's a wonderfully complicated diagram that you want to use. <laughs> you can read it in the PDF. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, Nestle um, is the world's largest food company, and it set itself um, a net zero target on all gases by 2050, um, and a 20% of the reduction in emissions by 2025, um, and a 50% reduction by 2030. Now, very interestingly about their ambition, um, fully um, the, the blue, 71% of their emissions, comes from their suppliers, not from its own operations. Um, Fonterra's largest customer is Nestle. So Nestle is sitting there going, oh, we need a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030. I have, I have at least confirm that Nestle is talking to Fonterra about this, but I don't know what Fonterra's reply. I don't know the nature, I still don't work out what the nature of that conversation is. But it has to be, uh, um, you need to contribute to this target. What are you doing about your emissions? And don't give this the usual stuff, but here there in New Zealand, you're so wonderful that your emissions per kilogram of meter or milk solids is a, a third less than the global average. Whatever it is, you've got to reduce it. Um, and uh, I'm fascinated how this is going to work out, because Fonterra still refuses to set, um, and indeed the whole dairy industry, um, and let alone sheep and beef farmers, are still refusing to set um, a goal for themselves on reductions in methane. Um, and they have sort of gradually accepted the very um, minor reduction that the, that the Climate Commission's recommended. But um, uh, that, to, to gradually accept a global goal, a, a national goal, doesn't help at all. You only start acting when you set your own goal in your own business to focus your mind, to focus where your research goes, to focus, in this case, on changing farming practices in the US. And I think it's, uh, I'm getting more and more um, impatient at that um, the longer these major agribusinesses in New Zealand refuse to set themselves goals, um, the more irresponsible they're being. Um, I could use a stronger word than irresponsible. Yeah. So that's what's going in the world. So what about us? We are the only country that has taken that planetary boundaries work um, and um, applied it to a country. This happened because Johan Rockström um, uh, was the climate laureate of the Hillary Leadership Institute here in New Zealand three years ago um, and came here and got very involved in this uh, and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And um, some of our fellow fellows, um, uh, such as uh, Felix, who does fabulous graphics for, um, uh, for Rockstrom and colleagues, and uh, Owen Gaffney, who works very closely with. Rockstrom are indeed fellows as well. Um, and so our Ministry for the, uh, for the Environment um, was very interested in what Rockstrom and colleagues are up to and um, has been working with niche producers. This landed just before Christmas last year um, and um, I'm pretty sure it was a deliberate strategy by Ministry for the Environment. They wanted to get this document out but they did not want to draw attention to it. And you think internally they care a lot about it, but they know that externally it's rather difficult. You can see our overshoot on climate change and those um, overshoot on phosphorus and nitrogen flows in the US. But this is a wonderful report to read, should you want to. Uh, all this adds up to some very, very profound change. It's true for the whole world. But this is what our Productivity Commission said back in August of 2017, and when it was looking at how profound this would be. The shift from the old economy to a new low emissions economy 
will be profound and widespread, transforming land use, the energy system, production methods and technology, regulatory frameworks and institutions, and business and political culture. Now, to me, the most important few words are the last, because if we don't have a big change in political culture and business culture, none of this will happen. We urgently need um, those two very big players in our system uh, to seriously lock onto this. And in due course, I uh, keep laying these seeds, as, uh, issues I'll come back to that I do, um, about um, the political outlook on this. I'm seeing something of a shift. Um, it's been building for a while. Um, I'd like to see it accelerate um, amongst the business community. But the business community, and it's a point I'm making in my column in Newsroom, to be published tomorrow. Um, if you look at um, how business, science, NGOs, civil society, generally politicians um, in the UK are, are giving the UK government huge stick for making ever bolder um, promises about what they're going to do, but being seriously delinquent on delivering the policies required or the regulations required to do this, um, there's been an amazing outburst from all those players um, focused at the government um, in the UK in the last couple of weeks. We need that level of um, uh, uh, deeply knowledgeable and credible um, uh, engagement on these issues. We can't just sit there saying, oh, it's only going to be all right. And the Climate Commission needs to deliver its recommendations to the government, and, and the government's got until the end of the year to come up with reductions in emissions plans. I'm sure Jacinda will do a nice job on that. And, and, and just leave them to it. Um, we can't. We, we've got to be keeping their feet to the fire every minute of the day and night over these next six months, because the nature of those plans that have drawn up, that overarching framework over the next six months, will fundamentally set the course we're on. And that's what's at stake here. And I'm deeply, deeply disappointed. Um, on one hand, I, I was happy on one hand, there were some very good solutions to the climate commission. Um, but um, only within the safe confines of putting a submission hoping nobody else read it. Um, you, you don't get anybody in business, even companies here in New Zealand that are on the forefront of this, um, standing up and being incredibly articulate about this, not just to the government, but to the public at large, um, the way very responsible companies are. Um, you know, nobody in New Zealand is doing a Nestle, for example. And you can be terribly cynical about Nestle and, and their infant, you know, it, it, yeah. But, um, it is very actively engaged with credibility, and that still was lacking in New Zealand. So, again, I won't trouble you with all the words here, but the basic point is that um, <coughs> the way this is shaping up about these co crises of climate and biodiversity um, is this is absolutely fantastic for us. On one hand, it's an incredibly eye watering challenge, but it's a fantastic opportunity. Because of all the countries in the world, this is World Bank data, we have the largest stock of natural capital per capita in the world, apart from fossil fuel dominated economies. Well, we all know where, how they're, that, that's all over for them. Please don't be cynical or, uh, about when we talk about natural capital. Um, this is a, 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 a higher level, more responsible version of capital rather than just the financial capital which is undermining the whole world for the moment. Um, because the, we haven't really tried responsible capitalism, we've only tried financial capitalism and look where that's got us. So if we, as we're trying to do here in New Zealand, have a living standards framework um, based on natural capital and social capital and human capital, and then the financial capital, but then also um, the physical and um, infrastructure capital. The natural capital um, used responsibly and working with nature, not against it, was a fine thing to do. So we've got this enormous stock of capital. And of course, um, it is a really important to our economy. The primary sector is very important, but every aspect of the primary sector, even down to second order issues, like somebody who has a job in the warehouse at Ashburton because um, to sell stuff to people who run the irrigators on the South Canterbury Plain. Even if you go to second order economic activity, 
the primary sector entirely, not just farming or fisheries or forestry, right, the whole bit, is only about 15% of GDP. If you add in uh, pre-pandemic international tourism, which arguably is also driven by natural capital, um, we're up to about 20%. There's a whole bunch of the economy that's got nothing to do with natural capital directly, but it's so fundamental to the quality of our life, how we define ourselves as a people here in New Zealand, and the responsibilities we have for that vast oceanic resource, and this wonderful land of um, um, native species of, 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 of plants and animals and life. Um, um, na the natural capital is, uh, it is big, it's a huge responsibility. Um, and um, so that's why the way this debate is going internationally around that um, is, um, I think, perfect for us. So this is, I'll just recap as to why um, this is uh, being such an important year. So thanks to the Zero Carbon Act um, in late 2019, I want to go back actually one stage. Um, in 2016, Generation Zero launched a campaign for uh, the Zero Carbon Act. Uh, literally a handful of people turned up in front of the Beehive when they launched that campaign. But Generation Zero are absolutely brilliant young people in terms of identifying issues and working out solutions and working with people to build coalitions of support around it. Um, the following year, um, uh, the Labour Party um, introduced it into their um, election manifesto. Then, of course, they were elected. And then in 2019, we got a zero carbon. <coughs> that was a brilliant piece of work by Generation Zero, along with many others. And those were young people uh, at the forefront of this. Anyway, that was the Zero Carbon Act. And because of that, we got the commission, and we've now got um, carbon budgets from them. Um, the first one's four years, because we behind, one year behind schedule and two five-year ones. Um, so February 1st, first deadline, the Commission published its draft carbon budgets and pathways, um, and then we had consultation, 15,500 submissions, um, uh, uh, which was fabulous. Obviously, some of them were pro forma, people just printing out something from Greenpeace or Generation Zero and sending that in or clicking the box, that's fine, that's an expression of interest. But there were some very thoughtful, many, many very thoughtful and detailed submissions. And then 31st of May, um, a month ago, um, the Commission um, submitted its proposals. Now, what happens next over the next few months is incredibly important. Sorry, all of us. The next important thing, and um, we don't know the timing of this yet. I was asking the Climate Minister uh, a week or so ago, at least not sure on the parliamentary process. But likely in October, Parliament will vote on the carbon budgets that the Commission is recommending. There is no problem with those budgets passing because uh, Labour has enough votes to do that. But the incredibly important part about these frameworks is that there is all party support. That's been the absolute key to the UK's progress since it was the first country to have this kind of framework starting in 2008. And even today, there is still a massive um, all-party um, support across the UK Parliament, even a Parliament ridden by Brexit and everything else beside. Um, it's remarkable how that um, political uh, consensus is held up around, uh, at least at a high level, um, a climate response. Um, so this is going to be, that vote on the carbon budgets, is going to be the first test to the National Party. Um, and I'm not at all confident they're actually going to vote for those budgets. Um, if they don't, we will get those budgets, but it will be very destabilizing because all those people trying to make long-term plans about how they're going to try and meet those budgets through the work they're doing in their farms or in their businesses won't have any certainty um, because it will be hanging over them that next time there's a national government, they might change the budgets, i.e. increase them to more carbon. That's the first test. And then a little later on, um, probably October, the government's got to decide what um, our upgraded commitment to the United Nations process is. So the Paris, uh, all countries agreed to come back five years later uh, with um, an improved um, nationally determined contributions. Uh, ours is very inadequate. It's now six years, because we didn't meet last year. That's why the meeting in Glasgow now is so important. 
the government has to tell us how big our NDC is going to be. <clears throat> and um, I think that's still hanging in the balance. Um, the um, planning commission favoured on that in many respects um, and said that ultimately, and I think this is actually right, rather than um, recommend an NDC, it was saying actually the decision on an NDC is actually a moral and a political issue. It's a, a moral and political decision, and which I actually is throwing this back to civil society and to politicians to say, you've got to decide, we've got to decide what we want and what we push for. We've got to push for a much bigger one. And then by December 31st, the government's got to come up with its overarching emissions reductions for that. So this is why this six months, um, the first six months, it's really important this year, this six months um, is a time really to campaign very, very hard, to be very clear um, to family, friends, neighbours, colleagues, um, our MPs, um, uh, and find every expression we can um, to um, give politicians the confidence to be bold. I think there is a willingness to do that on the part of a number of key people. Um, but they keep stressing that in a democracy they can only go where the majority of votes are. So that's why we've got to be very clear to them uh, what um, we are after. I only want to make one comment about the nature of our greenhouse gases. Um, this is a, a very high level view. We've basically got um, two sides to this. On the left hand side um, is largely CO2, some methane in there from household waste and stuff. Um, and um, that's a very big problem for us in New Zealand to reduce that CO2. Um, we can't build in more roads in Auckland. We've got to have huge shifts in um, transport modes. And we've got to be far more serious about energy efficiency in uh, new houses and old houses, retrofit, there's lots to do. We can more or less understand what we need to do. There's a very high capital cost to doing that. And none of that comes cheap. We're talking about billions of dollars. On the other side of the equation are the agricultural gases, um, obviously dominated by methane, but um, nitrous oxide um, is important in there too. And um, again, to simplify a very complex issue, my very strong sense of this, and I, I spend a lot of time in the primary sector, is that we have farmers who are showing us the way to change farming systems in ways to reduce methane far more strongly, sh sharply than the very weak targets um, agribusiness generally in New Zealand and, and now the Commission and probably the government is setting. But very interestingly, the capital cost of those transformations in farming system is actually low. And um, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of understanding that needs to be developed, a lot of science that needs to be developed. Um, but the capital cost of doing that is far less than on the other side. The next thing I say to everybody in towns and everybody I say in the country, we are mutually interdependent here. We're only going to solve this issue if both sides act. If one side acts and the other doesn't, we've lost. It doesn't matter which way it is. I mean, farmers could move ambitiously and people in towns don't, um, or vice versa. Um, and yet there is some real commonality between them. So yes, they're different gases, but the sort of ways we think about these things, the sort of ways we design policies, the sort of processes we put in place, and then indeed there are some uh, technologies to share across the piece. Um, so for example, um, electrifying all the um, process heat, for example, in uh, dairy and meat processing uh, would be a step forward, but that is also a technology that we're using on the left-hand side of the equation. So trying to um, build a sense of common purpose here between the, the, the parties and the players on both sides of the equation is really important. So planning commission tells us all sorts of stuff these are the carbon budgets, I won't dwell on them. Um, this is a useful chart to be thinking about because they've got various, two, four scenarios, the tail in one where everything goes in our direction, 
So we have um, an in, um, increasing um, amount, um, we get increasing behavior change this way, um, and we get um, uh, increasing um, reduction emissions um, through technology uh, up the way. So this is where we want to be. If we go down to the headwinds where we don't get the behavior change, we don't get the technology change, that's where we become more and more dependent on sequestering emissions um, in trees, because that's the only solution that we know about at the moment, or we're prepared to measure at the moment, and we should be measuring soil carbon, for example, and, and rewarding farmers. I know it's a very complicated subject. So what, that's where we want to get. We want to get maximum behavior change and maximum benefit from technology change, rather than just relying on nature. Uh, and um, again, here you see um, forests playing a role as a sink below the line, but thanks to the Climate Commission, a great emphasis on native trees there, particularly for the long term. Um, but notice the agriculture wise, the green, how little that shrinks. Um, most of the emissions reduction is on um, energy industry and building, the um, um, purple one in there, and some very significant reductions in blue on transport. Um, and um, so that's the basic sort of lie of the land. Um, one little chart somehow this works out in terms of policy. <laughs> Sorry, but it's all very serious. Oh, I'm going to stop talking. Um, I will go very quickly through um, very hopeful things I see. The Aotearoa Circle formed in 2018 by leaders in the business community and, and senior civil servants, um, very entirely focused on natural health. And um, um, the Fennec Forum, Rob Fennec, um, who died sadly um, um, 18 months ago, far too young, um, uh, was one of the founders. So uh, a productive, sustainable, inclusive food system and transport system and energy system and financial system um, to help drive this, very much the focus of the Arturo. So again, I'll leave you to a PDF, that's a schematic of where sustainable farming goes. Um, the Primary Sector Council, a, a short-term body formed by the last day, the first term of this government, last term, um, came up with a fit for a better world um, uh, as a primary sector strategy with a very, very interesting um, emphasis on um, um, uh, Ta'al, uh, the Maori worldview, uh, and uh, Mapa and Maori, um, Mata, um, um, indigenous knowledge working alongside um, to Western science. And um, there's a real head of steam building around this, uh, whether it's in an overarching strategy like that, whether it's in practitioners um, such as Hugh Jelly with his organization um, at a regenerative, uh, whether it's um, people thinking in terms of that in the tourism sector, um, and um, declaration of interest, I'm involved with Pure Advantage, and this is our regenerative future side of our website, um, focusing on, um, first of all, on um, farming, and then tourism and then forestry are the three big nets we've explored so far. This um, sense of this extraordinary um, town we have here in New Zealand of um, Kopapa Māori, um, I, I think is really important both um, because working together um, with Western science and traditional knowledge to advance both in ways that are very distinctive for us and very important and right for us um, culturally and for this land and these seas is, um, I, I think, is one of the great drivers that's going on. Back in 1900, over a century ago, um, Aparanga Nata um, talked wonderfully um, of Mataranga Māori and Mataranga Pākehā and the wonderful phrase, and the great benefit of casting our nets between them rather than fishing in one or the other. And uh, we're seeing this incredibly powerfully in the 11 National Science Challenges, which in their mandates are required to take a matter and engage with Mataranga Māori. 
And the place I see this most powerfully is in our land and water, national science, <coughs> but in biological heritage, even in the one for science and technology, for industry, they're taking this very seriously. And we, uh, I'm not at all familiar with this project up here on the top of the South Island. Um, uh, I've only read this document, um, but again, it's giving expression um, to some of this in terms of um, ecosystem restoration. <laughs> but rather than quote a, um, a New Zealand, um, a, a new, a, a somebody from Aotearoa on this, if you let me reach back into my cultural roots. I'm part Scottish, uh, some of my family live outside Edinburgh. Outside Edinburgh, John Muir was born there. In fact, my niece runs the John Muir Birthplace Trust and Museum in Dunbar. Uh, and um, John Muir emigrated with his family as a child to the US. And he is very much um, considered the father of the environmental movement in the US. Uh, and uh, here he is um, with, um, he took President Teddy Roosevelt on a camping trip in 1911 to Yosemite. Here they are at um, Overhanging Rock at Yosemite. And on that camping trip, Roosevelt was a great hunter, a great outdoorsman in that sense. Um, Muir persuaded, um, um, Roosevelt to establish the national park system in the US. Muir wrote about that in a lovely book, My First Summer in the Sierra, and this lovely, lovely sentence from it. When we tug at a single thing in nature, we find it attached to the rest of the world. And um, sorry, from the sublime to ridiculous, this is John Rotten. <laughs> I'm showing my age, and the words have probably held up better than music, or at least my music tastes have changed. You'll have no future if you don't make one for yourself. Thanks very much. <laughs>